So thank you for joining us again, the second day of our masterclass on photofilm. And uh, we, uh, I will shortly explain the structure. We have Janie Geiser from LA who will, for around 40 minutes, uh, show some two films, two videos, and uh, explain a little bit of her work. Then we have 30 minutes of Q&A, and, &A and uh, we will ask her, and you can ask uh, questions also, uh, uh, writing in uh, the live stream, and uh, they will arrive here and will be uh, asked to Janie. And uh, then we have 50 minutes a pause, a break, and then uh, there are um, Katharina and Timo who will join us and uh, present also for 45, around 45 minutes, the program and, and again Q&A. So that's the structure. Yeah, so let's welcome Jenny Geiser. Maybe we can just show her and her uh, <laughs> presentation on our screen. Hi, Jenny. Welcome. Hello. Welcome Hello. to Dresden. Good. Jenny was uh, in person here good. in 2016. Um, um, well, I'm, hap I'm happy to be here again a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, I'll just some few words because today you're also going to talk about your um, different ap approaches, artistic approaches. Um, yesterday, JD showed uh, two works, two recent works, Flowers of the Sky and 22 Light Years. Actually, it was very, we talked about this today during the breakfast at the hotel, uh, that, it, that, it, that it was very important yesterday in your talk that you actually mentioned that this work was done during the COVID time and this whole house structure, the house, the isolated house with the plants suddenly made a lot of sense and the, and the noises and everything. So today we are looking forward to get an inside look on your hybrid, multi-layered, uh, and <laughs> multi-media work. Um, for me, it was very important to ask you to share this as well, not just the films, because in uh, I, I think like act oh, that that's my imagination. I have never seen a live puppet play you're doing, but uh, my imagination is that there, there are influences or each each way of working influences also the, the, the other and inspires something in the other media. So we give you the time and space now to do your presentation. Great, great. Thank you. And thank you for having me. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so the curators had asked me to start with talking a little bit about my overall practice. So I'll just say that I studied as a visual artist and that's how I started making work and drawing and painting and sort of little objects and dioramas. And those dioramas started having like figures in them. And then I would put motors in the figures. And I was interested in things moving in a visual world, which then me to puppet theater. It was kind of a convoluted. Um, and that was really my main practice for, um, you know, at least 10 years of my career. And from that, I started adding film into the performances. First 16 millimeter film, which is difficult in a theatrical setting to get the right lighting and everything. And then video, which really made it more, um, much easier to kind of make everything more inclusive and part of the same picture frame. So I'm gonna start with showing you some performances from the last decade and just about Kind of ha it's all really related, as Katya said. It's I'm interested in materiality. I'm interested in objects or photographs or whatever I'm working with um, to come to some way. And with puppet theater, that's a very special process. You work with a lot of performers, and they are sort of breathing life into these wooden objects. But the audience is giving them life too, because once you start watching them, you begin to believe in them. I'm really interested in that, in that belief system of animating uh, unanimated objects and bringing them to life. So uh, I'll start the slideshow here with um, some images from performance. 
This is a piece called Clouded Sulfur, and I did this in around 2014. I, I was interested in bringing the Japanese practice of Bunraku theater, where three puppeteers operate a single puppet. And it's something I've used for a while, but in the Bunraku, one of the most notable things in the historical Bunraku was that the main playwright, Chikamatsu, uh, worked with real stories from his town. So I worked with an actual news story that I had read about in the paper about a girl who was kidnapped and unfortunately murdered. But what the part of the story that interested me the most was that her sister was trying to keep her story alive by you know, letting people know about it, by always letting the city council people know that they needed to find her. Um, so the, the, most of the play is about the sister looking for her missing sister. Um, and we use live video where, where a puppeteer might film a part of the show and then you see it live from a different angle. So working with the projection elements, this is the main, the sister who is looking for uh, Brenda, the disappeared girl. And you see Brenda around the set during the whole play until finally it comes to the moment where uh, the body is found. Oh, sorry, they're, they're following along with me and I just skipped two slides back. So I'll just keep going forward from now on. Um, so there are pro projections that are happening uh, throughout the piece of animated films that are much like my films that I make. So, And this the, the landscape of this giant mountain was sort of supposed to represent the distance from Los Angeles to these mountains two hours away where she was found. So I, I just love the physicality of puppet theater and the way that you see the performer's body bending to make the performance happen. Um, I'm also interested in the audience doing that. So I've done a couple of uh, performances that are diorama performances where I have a set of different stages and the audience walks from stage to stage to see the show and in small groups. So in this one, you see three people are peering into a kind of diorama and they're looking at this section of the play from different angles. And the dioramas also are plexiglass and they're sort of glowing so that they draw you to them. And each scene you look at in a different way. Um, this is the interior of that particular scene. And then they're performed live by puppeteers manipulating tiny figures in these sets. And it, it sort of allows me to show things in very different perspectives. So, and, and which is something I do in my film work as well. So in this one, you can look in the downstairs or the upstairs. It's sort of hard to see in the slide. And there are large feet walking on the upstairs level and below there's a woman knitting and she knits this long piece that gets pulled out by the puppeteer and begins to fill the space, which is sort of an expression of time. And you hear the sound of the feet walking. And this is looking in at her uh, working. So the audience really can choose sort of their own timing on where to look and which scene to see first in each, in each box, although the sequence of boxes is set. And it ends with this large panorama, um, kind of related to the Kaiser panorama, which was an early uh, film kind of object. And there are eight peepholes, and the audience is looking in those peepholes and watching a house revolve inside. So the scene is always kind of meeting their eyes. And then on the scene before, there's a puppet being filmed live and projected onto the house that they're looking at. So you can see in these more recent works, like the projection is really not just another element that's decorative or fills something in, but it's integrated into the way that the narratives are told. Um, this is a piece called Fugitive Time that I developed. Um, it was in the like 2016, and I had been reading about 
the history of Los Angeles as, as uh, a land a haven for people seeking good health in the early part of the 20th century. And it was really well, became really well known as a place to go if you had tuberculosis because they developed these sort of hospitals and they were just tent hospitals at the beginning, but then they turned into these huge tuberculosis clinics and people would come kind of like the Thomas Mann novel um, where, where you would just be in this beautiful environment and the land and the air was supposed to make you get better. So I found some films of people in iron lungs being taken care of by these nurses and that really formed the beginning of this. We actually recreated a video from the 30s about um, someone being taken care of in an iron lung. And then other, you know, there were other scenes too. But this one has the projection throughout of photographs. And there's uh, a performer on the side, which who you see through the whole performance, moving these photographs live under the camera and creating these uh, backdrops. And the set is a series of moving screens. So as the photographs are all are being moved, the screens are being moved and it creates a kind of uncanny evolving space. So I really like working with that documentary element in the performance itself and bringing that live feed projection into the show. Um, yeah, so that's fugitive time. So you can see the screens on the right, so they would move in and out depending on what the scenes were. I think they're catching up with me. I, uh, there we go. Um, I don't know if it skipped. I'm sorry if it did. Yeah, I think it did skip. So the the final scene is this main um, male figure who we've been following through his journey, um, and he's just walking with a cane while the table moves and the puppeteers move and all of the walls move. So um, you kind of sense his confusion and these endless hospital rooms. So the, the space here is very, not, not very deep, but the projection and the use of the screens makes it feel quite deep. So Soundhouse is the piece that I'm working on currently with two different composers. And these composers and I had worked on Fugitive Time together and the, um, in that process, we decided, oh, we wanted to make a piece that we start from scratch where none of us know what it's going to be. And so we each came to a, a meeting with one idea. And my idea was to work with um, sort of the, the actions of the people who work underground in the missile silos in the west of the United States, where they go in for 24 hour shifts and they spend all their time just maintaining the instruments, practicing what to ha what to do if they get the call to launch a missile, which luckily has never happened. And um, just kind of the environment that they're in and how boring it is and how task oriented it is and how it's kind of a task where you hope you don't do anything. Um, so, so they sleep, they eat, they play cards, they play games. And, they work in these areas that are um, just kind of very from 1960s because they don't like to use the internet um, because it's too hackable. So all of the equipment is very uh, analog. Um, so we, we created a kind of space where the audience walks around and sees all of these different tasks being done. And everyone that's working is working kind of on a different schedule. So the audience can come in and leave whenever they want. So it's kind of a performance installation and we do it for several hours. People can stay as long as they want or they can leave. Um, and so this is kind of looking at it from above. One of the composers, what he wanted to do was and do it by creating the walls, transducers and speakers in them. And as they move, um, uh, the proximity to other objects and other speakers. So there's no music per se that's written ahead. Everything, all of the sound is created by what's going on in the room. 
Um, so that's everything is there's a lot of chance in this piece and it's different every place we perform it. Um, there's also a lot of projection and the puppeteers are doing all kinds of tasks, some of them live writing on a screen, uh, live projection, moving photographs on the screen, but also we're using programs like Isadora to have other kinds of projections going on. Uh, so this is the a cutaway of one of these missile silos and the people work in the little area on the left and then they travel to the missile itself and check all the valves and make sure everything is working. So it's really, you're really underground for a long time doing this work. And this is sort of what the equipment looks like. So we tried to mimic that in some of our workstations so that you have this feeling of, you know, you're really in a kind of lost time. And the puppeteers and the puppets, you know, the, the puppets draw diagrams, they make formulas, they're, they're doing all kinds of tasks. The third uh, composer loved bricks. And so one, the third element in the piece is there's somebody always building and unbuilding structures made of bricks. And we found out that the Minutemen missile people they use a brick as one of their symbols. So it really worked out well. Um, one of our inspirations is like a NASA control room, or this is uh, an area of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Los Angeles. And basically that, that square is working in the back of the picture where everybody's working within the square and then there's an area around it. It's sort of how we structure our performance. Um, so I started making films as part of my performances rather than like I was doing film and then I added it. So the first films, as I mentioned, that I used in performance, they were more like fragments meant to be a certain scene of the piece and projected on the set or in some area of the set. Um, but then that really led me to want to make films as separate objects. and. The first, the first real finished film that I made was a film called The Red Book. And you can see in this, it's much more related to the puppet theater. I made sort of jointed figures that moved and were animated frame by frame. And, and most of my films have frame by frame animation as a big part of them, because I like the control that I can have in generating the imagery that way. So The Red Book, was the most puppet-like film. And then as I went along, I kind of expanded more into found objects, photographs. And I was working with a Bolex camera at the time. Everything was 16 millimeter. And then using that camera, I, I loved doing the superimpositions, you know, rewinding in the camera and shooting again. And so that idea of superimposition, which in a way is in the performances themselves of seeing things in different areas at the same time. So the superimposition is something that has stayed in the work, uh, even in the digital form. So um, I'm just gonna show you some images from different films. This is from the fourth watch where instead of using photographs or um, other collage images as one of the layers I used, I filmed off of a TV screen and I would advance the, you know, the DVD uh, like one frame at a time, or sometimes I would shoot uh, live off of the TV. And this piece called The Fourth Watch, I did shoot live because I was interested in the roll bars that I would get from the different frame rates of the film and the TV. And also you can see it's an analog TV. That's the only way you can get that texture of the grain of the screen. Now it's all too smooth. And then I superimposed those images into a dollhouse that I shot. So this piece actually has no animation. It's all shot live on the Bolex. Um, but, you know, I continued to work with all different kinds of found materials and with mats. So pretty much from the beginning, I, I decided to start, you know, using mats to define different areas of the film frame. I definitely am interested in breaking up the frame a lot um, so that we're not always so much looking at this rectangle. And I think Thomas spoke about that yesterday, that 
that you're hardly ever looking just at the edges and bringing photographs of people in also this is a film called the floor of the world and it, it sort of relates to valeria street which i'm going to show today in the sense that this figure of a, is actually my father um, as a young boy i was making the film and it had a lot of these kind of diagrams and little tiny dolls and cutouts and i just felt like it needed something else and i was in a room in my house, looking at this picture of my dad on the wall, and I was like, oh, okay, he's perfect. So I took him out of the frame and photoshopped him and uh, brought him into the film. Um, I like to have figures that look into other places. So this is a film called Ghost Algebra, where I'm using this figure, which is she's got she's so like physical because of the seam in her and um, i really like the way that that just really announces how artificial she is and she's looking into these bunkers that i found in a book in prague of i think there are world war one bunkers maybe there are world war two but they feel older than that um and she sees sort of the history of, of war in, in these bunkers and there are a lot of images of you know, body parts and destruction. Um, this is from a film called Arbor, which I showed here at, at um, the photo film, film, film festival in Dresden and did a talk about. So this was a group of photographs that I found that were actually from Germany. And um, they, they depicted a group of people on a hillside. And I, I feel like this was sort of my first really pure photo film, even though, of course, it used other elements, but I was really investigating who these people were, why were they on this hillside, and I have no answers. Um, but I, in the course of the film, I used a lot of Photoshop and kind of took people out of the images and ended up with everything going back to the landscapes, because part of my thought was like, these people are no longer at this place photographs you know just document a moment even if you take a photograph yourself today that moment is gone it's a document but the people are no longer in that spot and everything has changed and finding things in a thrift store it's also another layer of that absence is that someone has abandoned these images they couldn't quite throw them away which i like um, but the images um, live on through people finding them and reanimating them um, the way also Timo and Caterina do. This is another image from Arbor. So he also used a lot of shadow imagery, um, patterns and plants to kind of fill out this idea of this hillside that they were on. Um, this is from a film called Cathode Garden, which uses not only found imagery, but found recordings from my mother's family. And um, that they used to record these little red records somehow at home. And there's all kinds of birthday parties and get togethers that are very remote sounding on the record, but they, they bring in actual voices of my family members, like my aunt, who is 85 now. Um, as a five-year-old reading um, a, a little book. I'm so proud of being able to read. So the activation of these images with those sounds was very powerful for me. This is another image from Cathode Garden. Um, I also like to work with found footage and used a, a film that I actually found on the street in New York City. Um, of two boys reenacting a battle in a fort in Fort Marion. It was a like a school, you know, documentary about this battle, but with these two boys, and um, they they pretend to be in war. And at the time, my son was maybe about eight years old, and that was what he and his friends would do a lot too. So I was kind of thinking about how violence and childhood are integrated and the fascination with that kind of violence too. Um, this is a film called Ricky that uses a lot of different elements, including some paper film strips that are like a child's toy from the 30s. And 
again. This is also from Ricky. So with each film, I'm sort of find one or two main items that start the film, uh, or I look for something particular because I have an idea. And then the other things that need to surround it and fill it out start to become apparent. I know what I'm, what kinds of things I'm looking for. So with Ricky, you know, I found early um, books about you know, reading and writing because it was a came from a record that was made by somebody to his son, like a letter to his son. Um, it's a recent from a recent film called Reverse Shadow that also has this idea of guns and violence and childhood because I found this sort of childhood toy that was a shooting game. Um, this is from the same film of this sort of vulnerable that uh, was uh, from a medical illustration book. And also from the same film, I, I one time when I was taking a flight, maybe it was to Dresden, I don't know, uh, where you're sitting on an international flight and you have the little screen in front of you where it's showing you where you are in the world by the plane flying over some fictitious landscape. So I love those planes and I shot lots of iPhone footage of them and I used a lot of that in this particular film. And then um, this is from a film called Fluorescent Girl where I, I used a famous photograph, which you know was kind of weird, I'm worried about it, but I was in a bookstore and I saw a book by Paul Strand of his photographs and the fluorescent light of the bookstore was reflecting on the book in this beautiful way that was making all these abstracted shapes of light. So I just took out my phone and started photographing it in the bookstore. And that those digital photographs of photographs became the basis of that film. Um, this is actually another image from Ricky. So using three dimensional images, um, figures, you know, in these sort of artificial landscapes is something I like to do, which again, very much related to the puppet theater because there's a performance of the objects in the making of the film. Um, this is from, oh, the Hummingbird Wars, which another sort of war type thing, but um, it's about actors moving through these landscapes as they perform this kind of Shakespearean, made up Shakespearean drama and uh, a lot of flowers in this one too and uh, wounded people from a first aid book. Uh, and Flowers of the Sky, which some of, if you were here yesterday, you, you saw that film working again with, you know, documentary kinds of photographs, but then adding my own fiction to them. Um, and the same with 22 Light Years, which was the final film on the program yesterday. Um, so last in this section is uh, installation. I'll just show you a couple of installations. So for me, installation is kind of a place where the visual art and the performance and the projection come together because the installations have a kind of performative quality, but they're not dependent on performers. So the first one that I'm going to show is one called The Spider's Wheels. I had been watching a lot of early film and especially serials, like women serials. And in these serials, of course, there are these female heroines who are, you know, fighting all the odds and coming out, you know, on top of the end and finding the villain. Often they have some support from men. Uh, but this is one that was from Perils of Pauline. And Pauline is like going through a tunnel of a submarine to go into the water to somehow escape some bad person. Um, but I had this idea of bringing in sort of the surface of kind of stitching with these plexiglass uh, shapes that are hand stitched together to kind of bring in like the cold and the handmade together as the form that she was projected on. And then there were these metal flaps that would open at one point in the three minute cycle and then they slam down on her. So it's quite loud. Um, so here you see the flaps are up. So it's motorized. I had to get help from some technical people that I know that created this sort of timed motor structure for it. 
And then this is a more recent projection uh, installation called Look and Learn. It actually, again, Katarina and Timo, there's so much similarity in our attraction. So I started with a set of like four um, photographs that had children in squares, like their classroom pictures. They weren't standing all there together, but they were put in these squares. And really seeing that sense of order that was imposed by the structure and working with those images in different ways. So there was a three projector piece, and then there was a piece in the corner that had moving mirrors that were projected onto. And so then the images would kind of move around. And then the third projection was actually just one, one image that was moving. So these are just different installation shots from that. So now I think we're going to screen Valeria Street. And I, I forgot to put my timer on, so I don't know where we are with the time, but hopefully we're still doing OK. Um, so Valeria Street is about 10 minutes long. So we'll, we'll look at that film, and then I'll talk about that and a little bit about the final film, Absent Objects. Um, so I think we could just screen Valeria Street. Hopefully. Um, while we're waiting for that, we, I can say Valeria Street is a, another film that uses my father as a, the center of the film. Uh, so I think we're going to see it now.
Um, so let's see if the screen share can start again. Okay. Um, so Valeria Street, uh, it's, it started when I, um, I found in my studio, I have a lot of things in my studio and a box of slides fell on the floor when I was looking for something else. It was one of those great yellow Kodak boxes, clearly from probably the sixties. And I thought it was just something I had found in a thrift store. I didn't really recognize it. It had just been around for a while. And I decided to just look at them and see what they were. And they were large slides instead of the one by one, they were two by two. So they were a little bit bigger than usual. And I took them and put them on the light table and started to look at them through uh, the lens. And then I saw this image, it was quite small and I kept you know, enlarging and enlarging it um, with the lens until I saw that it was this group of men around a very generic office table, looking at plans in a very staged photograph. But the person in the middle was my father. Um, so I had never seen these images before. So my father has been dead since 1997. And I guess when I, I was helping clean out the house and pack up his stuff, I ended up some of the film and slides that he had um, because I was sort of the only one in the family that might be interested in that or I digitized some of it for the family. Um, so there were seven of these slides all around this table. So they did sort of suggest sort of an animated sequence uh, and also made me think of, you know, like, um, famous paintings from uh, like Rembrandt where you have the people around the, ta the table or men talking. So it was very much, you know, male power in an office setting, but my father was at the center of it, which was not really how I had pictured him that much. Um, he was a chemical engineer. He worked for Exxon and he only was able to enter that world because he had been a soldier in World War II. And in the States, there was the GI Bill, which would, would help these soldiers, mainly the white soldiers. It was much harder for Black and Native American, Latino soldiers to take advantage of this because of other policies in the US. Um, but my father had grown up quite poor and he fought in the war. And then he was able to go to college because of this GI plan. And he didn't know what he wanted to study, but you know, he was smart and he had done well in like math and science. So they said, okay, um, chemical engineering. And so he was, okay. And he did a lot. He liked using that side of his brain and right out of the college program, he was recruited by Exxon. So my whole life, I grew up with my father working for Exxon. And as I got older, that also became, you know, kind of an issue for me. Like, what does this mean that, you know, this is how he makes a living with this petrochemical company that is exploiting the world. Um, so those questions came into this and they were questions I would ask my dad you know, after some big oil spill. And he was just, he wasn't a callous person, but he was a different generation where like resources were there to be mined and used for the good of people but the pollution really wasn't really a part of their thinking um, or they put it aside. So here he is making, you know, looking at plans for something, um, probably some kind of chemical plant and having some fake stage photographs about this process that were somehow serving the company's goals. Uh, it's almost like they just put them in a room somewhere to do this. But I, I really, liked this sequence and kind of how how it felt like all these artificialities involved in these real people. Um, so I had been making a lot of films based in photographs. So this was kind of a difficult thing to think about because I, it's my father, he's not a stranger. How can I take this and kind of blow it open a little bit more so that it's not just me like a documentary about my dad. Um, so I kind of sat on these slides for quite a while before I could sort of free them up in a way to treat them the same way that I would treat other found images. 
of course, with the knowledge that this was my father. So I started bringing in images of sort of industry. This is actually like a diagram of a water coolant system, but it also looks like a building. Um, and then I started to work with the images themselves. I, like here, they were very faded slides, but here's the generic ceiling in the room of these tiles and just, you know, working with those. And I quickly kind of got rid of the original color and went more black and white um, and then changing the color of that too. Or I would take an image and I would take a lot of people out of it so that I could put other things into it. So once I kind of got started with manipulating the images, it, it helped to free me up. Oops, I'm going the wrong way. Sorry, uh, stay where you are. Okay, so, um, and then making things negative and black and white so that more and more things could get layered into the images. Um, for instance, the plans that they're looking at, other images could appear in those plans or things could float through the room. Um, and then just really working with the set of images of the men and breaking them up in different ways, bringing in just like office machinery, like the old Xerox machines actually cut into the place in a, one of the photographs, you know, in a copy of it where the plans were and then animated images under that. So it became really fun and I got a little bit obsessed with it. Uh, I made these mats that one mat was black uh, mat with, you know, open space and one was a white mat with open space so that then I could photo merge them together and get these sort of positive negative images that were shot through the open spaces. So there's a lot of compositing that happened. Uh, I just wanted to really energize the images and um, bring other things into this, uh, kind of to look at my own feelings about this, this work, which you know supported my life and brought my father and our family out of poverty and you know really became the basis where I could go to college. So, um, and I, I also never really visited much at work. That just wasn't the thing you would do. So it was fascinating for me to think about how he was in this other environment and the people that he worked with. And I showed the picture to my mother. She didn't recognize any of these men. So it may have just been something where some people came to town for some signing or some kind of um, look at how this plant was going to be built. So, but I was fascinated with the office and the genericness of all of that and isolated elements like the men's feet or their hands gripping the table and um, worked with those things. So these other elements that came into play were things about geometry because my father, I would get up in the morning when I was a kid and my father would be at the kitchen table drawing diagrams. It was always a lot of geometry. He had a slide rule. He was doing mathematical formulas. And I've always sort of loved diagrams and formulas and this kind of visual language of figuring out the world in these abstract ways. So that became an important visual element. And then also I even found uh, an image in my mom's closet of one of these plants that he worked at and then also bringing in ideas about home and what does that mean in relationship to this, this kind of work. Um, so the title Valeria Street is actually the street that my dad lived on when he was a child. But it's, so just, you know, these are not diagrams that necessarily relate to his work, but just to this sense of figuring out the world through these mathematical and abstract geometric forms. And then I found illustrations of a house that were kind of, kind of treated in the same way as these geometric forms. So that those became really important. Um, and then I animate these forms and layer them to get this also this sense of kind of the, the gaseous nature of this work and the kind of tumbling of forms together of kind of chemistry. So this was actually the image that I found in my mom's closet of these um, 
I think it's liquid oxygen, liquid nitrogen tanks that for a while, during the period that I surmised that the photograph is from, he was working with a branch of Exxon that dealt with liquid gases. So like liquid oxygen, liquid nitrogen, the things you see stored in these big tanks all over the place. Um, so I was really happy to find that image itself. And just, you know, bringing in just symbols of the power and uh, power both people and of like electric power and the kind of power that the petrochemical industry supports. Um, also, you know, more and more I've been using my phone to, you know, collect images when I'm just out in the world. And I was driving uh, one day in LA and I noticed this huge like sort of rooftop plant, you know, top of a, some industrial building with all these amazing shapes on it. I have no idea what they do. They probably have nothing to do with the petrochemical industry, but I just took my phone and put it against my window. I was, I was in really slow traffic, so I just um, would hold it while I was driving slowly forward and shot this pan of these shapes and then, you know, put them into negative and change the color. So they almost have almost like a video game feeling to them, which the phone does anyway with the sense of time and that. So I love these kind of landscape of industry that's all around us, um, images that supported that. And then they were in this office with those curtains. So I was at a residency where there was a library with these beautiful red heavy curtains. So I filmed those and those show up in the film. So everything, you know, when you're working on a piece like this, everything around you sort of helps inform it. And I find things that I wouldn't normally notice that become part of the film. Um, so then the Valeria Street, I, I kind of wanted to take this whole journey that my dad had been on back to his beginning, which, as I said, like he was during the depression, he and his father would walk around and pick up metal. That's how poor they were um, because my grandfather lost his job and uh, it was pretty dire. But the, the, the house that he grew up in, I was able to find it on Google Maps. Um, and it looks a lot nicer now. It's like just like a one, you know, three room house. And um, so that, that house kind of comes back into his life here in this film. And uh, that was like a street, street map, a lot map that I found of his neighborhood. Um, and then kind of like the first plant that I shot in LA, my, my mother now lives in Athens, Georgia. And every time I go see her, I drive down the street where there's this, some other kind of plant or storage facility for probably some liquid nitrogen kinds of things. And so um, I had somebody else drive this time and I sat in the passenger seat and shot a long pan of this area. Um, and that sort of becomes the culminating section of the film. And part of what, what I liked about that is sort of moving out of the animation, although it keeps coming back into it and having this kind of long sequence that, that leads to the ending. Um, just as a visual sequence. And again, you know, changing the color, changing a lot um, the way it looks, the contrast. And it, it doesn't really matter if it's not petrochemical, I don't know what it is, but it's just this landscape that we live with so much that you might be in a, a town or a city and suddenly you're in this area that has all of this, um, you know, storage facilities, electrical facilities, you don't know exactly what they are, but you know that it's kind of functioning in some way in your life that you you don't really acknowledge. Um, so anyway, I sort of loved this area of, of her current town and then brought the geometry back into that and brought other images of the men back into that. Um, I should say something about the sound for Valeria Street. Some of it is just found sound that I, I gathered but while I was working on the film, I went to a program um, of experimental film, music, performance at a little art space in Los Angeles. And someone I knew was performing, Laura Steenberg, who's a really amazing 
um, contemporary composer, performer. And she was playing a piece on a large plastic tube. And she was just blowing through the tube and making all of the sound herself. And it had this very open feeling, but also sort of um, a little bit scary and, and um, not for for time. You know, it had a sense of time about it that I liked that was very intuitive and kind of related to the body because of how she was making it. So I, I quickly, you know, talked to her after the show and I said, could I, could I maybe use that piece of music? And she had a recording from a different performance of it and she sent it to me and I just put it against the parts of the film that I had already edited at that point. And it just seemed perfect. So sometimes those things happen too, that if I hadn't gone to that concert that night, I wouldn't have really known about that piece of music. And then she gave me some other recordings. So that's sort of harmonica sounding music at the end is a different recording from Laura. Um, so then the film finishes with these images of trees that are at the end of that, uh, that section of industry. And, and, but the trees are behind barbed wire. So it somehow seemed to encapsulate something about this whole question about, um, you know, the role of this industry in our lives and you know, the way that nature is being um, destroyed in our lives. But we're all, I drive a car. So um, we're all also, many of us are complicit in it um, because we participate in it and that's sort of our life right now. So it's me also questioning you know, my own role in all of this. But also there's a lot of love of my father in here. It's not all like a critique of his job. Um, I, I, you know, so it was also me reanimating my father to sort of bring him back to me. That's what was so shocking when I saw the images. It was like, whoa, there he is. You know, I found him again in some place I've never seen him. So it was very powerful for me. Um, and then I brought a little bit of color back in the very end. Uh, and then the, the last film that I'm going to show is called Absent Objects. And this is very much a pandemic film as well. What, you know, while, while the whole last year, uh, up until like around March, you know, we were pretty much just at our house, walking around the neighborhood and not going anywhere. And I was in my studio a lot. And um, so, and I was teaching, but it was all on Zoom. So everything was just kind of here. And I spent a lot of time in my studio because it was just seemed like that was the place to be. And while I was looking for something else, I found this photo album that I had bought years ago, thinking that it might be something to use as maybe a series of maps. Uh, it, it was early 20th century, very like heavy pages that are like cardboard with different ovals and squares cut out to hold pictures, but there, are no, there were no photographs in it. So those had been taken out and just the album was left behind. And even at the time that I found it, I, I thought that was quite poignant, but finding it in the middle of this pandemic, it felt incredibly poignant. It felt like, oh, these are the people that are gone. You know, this is a representation of, of not being here. It's a photo album with no photos. Um, and I actually had, you know, so the pages were quite interesting with the photos torn out and you see the structure of the pages and they see through to each other and some of them are sort of ripped. Um, so they create great shadows and tunnels and almost feel like architectural. Um, and, and then I had actually uh, a couple of other of these albums that I'd picked up over the years, not really knowing what I was going to do with them. So this second album, um, the images were also removed and you kind of have the ghost of the images uh, where they were. I also liked the way that a lot of each album had a different way of holding the pictures. Uh, this one just used slits and you can see probably this bottom one on the right was like a glass or a clear Maybe it was a negative because it, you can almost see the picture printed on it. And yeah, I just love these slits. And then the third album had no cover. 
um, and it had a lot of different, you know, photo corners that created these beautiful patterns on each page and had some layers of tissue paper between the pages to protect the photos that are no longer there. So these, these three albums became for me kind of a, um, the presence of absence and I don't know who was in there. And um, so they just became the source of the film. And I can talk a little bit more about that afterwards, but um, it's a five minute film. So we'll screen absent objects now.
Jenny? I'm back. Okay, so we thought maybe we'd go directly into the Q&A, if it's okay for you. Yes, that's fine. Yeah, and we thought from time-wise, it's uh, here it's 7.20, so we, we would say like 20 minutes of discussion and then 15 minutes break. Okay, great. Okay, would you like to join us, Timo and Katharina? Yeah, maybe we start that with the films. It's more easy because we have just seen them, uh, Valeria Street. Uh, I see many uh, technical imaginary you know, drawings, technical <laughs> drawings, technical design, geometric elements, and uh, I see also <coughs> persons uh, you know, which are inside these structures. So one of my questions is, if, do you see in animating, is there a difference if you have this structure, this pattern images, or these more or less individual, like you know, the five people with their father around your father, the four people around mm -hmm. your father, or uh, the house where he lived, and which has something, for me, it has, some, it has a history always, there's a more individual element, but what does it mean to you as an animator? Is there diff are you a photograph mm -hmm. animating in a different way than a technical drawing? Uh, I think that's a great question, Thomas. Nobody's ever asked me that. Um, I guess there is a little bit of difference because with the humans, um, I'm, I am aware of their humanness and especially in this film, trying to keep that humanness. And Echo, are y'all getting that? Yeah. Okay, then I'll just deal with it. It sounds like a phone. Um, so, huh. You mean I sound like I'm on a phone? No, no, it sounds like if there's a phone ringing. But now it stopped. Yeah, it's okay um, for us now. Okay, okay. Um, it's all right. So, so yeah, I, I think there probably is a difference. It's probably more intuitive than something rational. But with the patterns, I do feel maybe more freedom to. Oh yeah, they're not seeing me, but that's okay with me. <laughs> see Jane here on the monitor. Can we put Jane here on the screen, please? Yeah. So sorry. We will put you on the screen so the audience can okay. see you. Okay. Right. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. I'm not just a disembodied voice. You can make me as small as you want to. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, okay. So so yeah, I think that's a great question, and I I do think I think about them a little differently. I don't have a real great explanation about it, but I, I love the question. Are there questions from the audience? Or if you have a question, please just uh... raise your hand and we come with the mic. Yeah. And uh, yeah, but uh, because in the film about the work of your father, it's very clear that these structures are uh, on our shoulders. They are, you know, it's very hard mm. that we live inside the people, the individuals live inside of these structures. Right. And the structures, Right. To my uh, recognition, they don't help. No, they. Uh, no, that's <laughs> more or less a problem. No? And, and you have, uh, of course, you have always nature in your films. No, this last uh, yesterday mm -hmm. there were the flowers and in color and so on. And mm -hmm. now we had uh, mm -hmm. the last film, for example, the the noises mm -hmm. of the forest. Mm -hmm. No, the cuckoo and so on. And uh, so uh, we have a counterweight. But uh, of course, that's my imagination. That no, there is nature and and uh, uh, plant uh, and uh, as a counterweight to structures. But, uh, but, but you, uh, you, how do you feel about these structures? It's, uh, this mm, it's no, uh, compounds, no, compounds of our lives. No? We are in these, uh, no, uh, um, uh, so in these big houses no? and in these structures, we are, we are working there. No, no, not we as artists, uh, but many other people. <laughs> Right. Well, I mean, and even the structures in the film, often the figures are kind of embedded into them. There's a confinement from those structures and then the structures that are in the landscape. So in this film, I don't think I really use any real flowers. 
or real plants. There's only photographs or film of, of nature. So kind of putting them and the, the industrial landscape much more together. And, and this industrial landscape is taking over the natural landscape and also our bodies. Yeah, so there's, there's a lot of that and even um, the bodies being embedded in the geometric structures as well. So how do I feel about it? I, I don't, it's, yeah. it's complicated. <laughs> Yes. Go ahead, maybe, maybe I can say something to that because I already had the feeling yesterday about um, the black and white um, images you used yesterday. I think the black and white always makes kind of an abst abstraction of a human body or a face. And um, right. um, today I had the same feeling when we saw the film of your father, these guys sitting on this table um, looking at this plan of the world <laughs> and I mean now we know it's your father but actually it feels like it's actually a kind of a symbol for a moment of power or like a position mm -hmm. of bodies in a room where they have power so I, I oh, yesterday I already had the feeling that it's always kind of an abstraction of human kind or it, it's not so much mm -hmm. actually about the individual person but about the um, position in society or so yeah more like a, yeah yeah a placeholder I, or I think something. that's a great that's a great comment yeah the somehow when they were more fleshy looking I couldn't do as much with them I really needed to abstract them into the black and white and then sometimes you know the additional color that I'm adding but it's still a monotone um and and yes I was really interested in those positions of power and then of course shocked to see my father inside them because you know mostly when i was with my dad he was with us we were six kids he was playing basis and you know we were doing things that families do but then seeing him in this horrible office with these very uh staged versions of power and himself at the center of them it just kind of was a lot to handle for me <laughs> yeah, um, but i was also interested in it in an abstract way that's okay no and i think especially using then a still image is even making that gesture bigger because it's not alive it's really like nailed down to this they, they are really nailed down to that position position so maybe right. they would even in in the moment they would even make nice movements or be somebody else but in that moment right. where the picture was taken they're really in that position and right. it's actually like yeah. A, it's yeah, a very iconic position yeah, right. but maybe it just has to do with photography in general because it's always then bigger than life. If you have one single image, no? and uh, and we see here time that is captured in the image, uh, it's like the uh, 70s or something like this, no? uh, but it looks like 60s because you made it in black and white, but uh, there is <laughs> re registered time inside and registered structures, ne, power structures, the absence of the women, ne, uh, you, you, ne, this gender issue right. is, of course, ne, very clear to everyone. And uh, so there is, ne, it's like exploring this, this one, this thing, uh, this photo, no? and, and the life. Right, so that, so that was for the people. Yeah, for me, you know, as I talked about, having this be my father, but still wanting to look at it abstractly that way, Katerina, like this is a group of men in a room. This is representing a certain kind of power that was really ascendant then, but is still pretty much around right now. Um, and, and then trying to think of both the personal and the sort of generic or bigger or symbolic. Somebody took those photographs. They decided to stage the group this way. And so there's an agenda about what they're trying to project about this company and their work that's in the photographs. And probably the men are not that comfortable with this. I wish my dad was still around to ask them about it. <laughs> so may maybe I can um, tell another aspect that I sort of um, gathered when I was 
watching that movie, uh, and this is exactly the uh, situation in in the office, where I have seen a group of men concentrating of something, and and even if you mm -hmm. put another three images to it, when where they slowly move, kind of, then mm -hmm. uh, I got even more the uh, the impression that they are concentrating on something and then you also told us that they were working on chemical substances i mean well they they were compressing um oxygen and 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 other um, gases to liquid which is a concentration again and then i have right. seen a whole, oh, whole lots yeah. of concentration all all over the movie like you concentrate yourself on geometrical uh, um, shapes and, uh, and and also you concentrate yourself in uh, certain um, aspects of a um, geometrical object which can be seen also as a house which is a small house and uh, and and obviously uh, there are a whole lot of other concentrations aspects of it like um, you know as your father fought in the Second World War, so he concentrated to winning the war, and then mm -hmm. he got the possibility. I would say, I would say, he concentrated college. on staying alive. <laughs> <laughs> well, th this is a very good one, actually. It's <laughs> even better than I, I was putting. So, so, so basically, um, and 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 I, I have seen this positive uh, um, aspect of of the movie. And then I thought, okay, um, but if you um, if you produce a lot of concentrational things uh, in the industry, then it it could be also something destructive. So, um, mm -hmm. but I, I I rather wanted to put the positive aspect I have seen in the movie. Mm -hmm. I, I really like that idea of concentration. Actually, this is this is an attribute we personally give also to the, this uh, photo film thing because you can compress mm -hmm. time and uh, you know you do it because you you add a lot of layers and actually you're really compressing time. I, I like this uh, what you described how you because we always thought okay you find photographs but you also in this moment when you start producing you actually you found a lot because you said okay and then there then there was this <laughs> and and i edited and then there was this music and it was a coincidence if i have would if i wouldn't have been there then this music would have not been in the film so you actually like your right. found footage is not just focusing on the flea market or the antiquariat <laughs> where you find images but it's really every each material which is right. inside sound and image and moving image even um even the coincidence that you film outside your car while driving <laughs> you know so th 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 that's that this was a very interesting aspect I, I i learned now from you how actually you you collect huh. and watch and and be curious and see what what could be added to the film yeah. Yeah, I think yep. it's something I was talking about, like, w when I'm working on something, and I think this is probably true for the other artists in the room, you're inside of that project, and then you notice things that maybe wouldn't have had importance before, or things kind of come to you that you wouldn't have noticed before, and now they're very important, and you see how they can work. So it's, it's the principle of collage, really. Um, that when you have a lot of things on your table and you put something down, then something else sort of calls to be put together with that, either to go with it or to burst it open or fight it. Yeah, and we thought of it in terms of constellation. There are constellation of images, mm. and uh, mm. so and of sometimes of happiness. No? Sometimes it's uh, contrary, but uh, it's these uh, no, your films. They they inside there's a utopia. There's this flea market. No? You find the images on flea market. You said okay, uh, this time I have my personal archive from with my father. But uh, in general, you will deal with it no? as as if it is someone. 
and uh, when I saw the first time the film, I didn't know it's your father. And so for me, it was uh, some poor guys. I thought, okay, these poor guys <laughs> have to work there. And, uh, and, 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 and but yeah, the the way you do the film, that's the, I want to talk about this kind of archive, the free market, an unstructured archive where something can happen. You can mm. find, luckily, no, uh, some interesting and uh, constellations, some interesting meetings no, of different photos maybe no and uh, and uh, mm -hmm. and so maybe uh, what do you think about your archive about uh, the 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 type of flea market archives because you you talked about yeah. abandoned images isolated images mm -hmm. no? they have left lost their history they have lost their producer they have mm -hmm. lost if you buy them at the at the flea market mm -hmm. well they're abandoned but they don't totally lose their history i think some of that is embedded in the object or the image and you can maybe not know it specifically, but you can intuit things about that. So it's kind of a collaboration between that past that's in these and then bringing the present or whatever I'm thinking about or whatever I'm responding to in them together. But I like this idea of conditions um, that it's not just in one point, it's kind of all over. And like constellations, they're always circling around each other. They're, they're in motion and they might intersect with each other's orbit at some point that will produce something fruitful. I want to say too, just like you, somebody brought up the word like, I don't know, happiness or something. Like the process of making makes me really happy. So even if I'm working with dark, imagery like the process of making is so concentrated and exciting that i love being in in that process yeah i think that was really nice yesterday to see the trailer in your backyard and to <laughs> actually see the light table and um, that you explained that you are really doing an analog um, animation and it's kind of a performance you do there so um, mm -hmm. then after that, watching another film of yours, it was really nice because I could like more imagine how actually the process of production was, would maybe look like. Um, and, and then it felt actually like a dance with your ha hands or something, like watching ah. the films, um, mo the moving patterns was um, really nice to get that inside glimpse of your production process. That's great. Thank you so much for that. So now it's seven forty, and if there are, is there any question from the audience? Because this would be like the last chance. We thought we may, we we will discuss on like two more minutes, maybe two more questions, <coughs> and then make a little break, continue with Timo and Katarina, and then have a chance to come back with Q and A and you joining us for this uh, Q&A after the presentation of Katharina and Timo. So, That's any more questions? No? One no. last question? <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> yeah, I don't know if it's a question, but I just, uh, if I think no, about uh, the whole of your uh, oeuvre, of the, no, the whole work you've done, for me it's a great recycling machine. There are images no, found on the flea market, images from your personal mm. archive, and, and everything is about the general atmosphere. No? It is not important, each mm. single frame or each single <laughs> image, but, but to create special atmospheres, and, and uh, sometimes for, for me, it is a little bit mysterious how you find the hierarchies of the images, no? which no, they ca have oh. to come back, no? uh, like uh, <laughs> no, the, two, the, the guy standing there, stiff, and, and the yesterday was, in the, no? and then you introduce the image, and then it comes back a second time, and then the third time, and so uh, no, it becomes very clear where, as a structure where, uh, of the film, <laughs> is very rational, very, uh, but, but I can't follow it, I don't know how you did it, <laughs> how you experienced it. No? Um, yeah, it's, it's kind of like music. Like the structures of the film, I, 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 I'm not composing it like music and it's not even that rational, but there is a kind of musicality, I think. It's, it's about the rhythm of how the film moves forward 
as much as it is about all of the other elements of content or contrast or composition. Rhythm is really important. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so this is very nice. Yes, thank you very much. Nice <laughs> closing words for the thank moment. You. Yeah. The rhythm is <laughs> so the most important. Yeah. Thing. And this is Hitchcock told us already. With music in, like music yeah. is ah. your starting point, so there's another connection. And that, that's the only uh, oh, oh. that's the difference because we always start with a song that's already there, and then we find ah. pictures, ah. and you find music as well, or uh, get to meet mm -hmm. interesting musicians. Or so, but I found uh, right, today right. I saw some things that we have in common as well, and uh, we will show you now. <laughs> Oh, ten so minutes. I, I can't <laughs> wait to be in something <laughs> like, yeah, ten minutes or yeah, no, yeah, we it's make okay. ten minutes break, yeah, because you need to to start your machinery mm -hmm. here, <laughs> the, the recycling <laughs> machine, <laughs> and the others have right. a drink, and then we come back and we meet us in yeah. ten minutes. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Janie. Thank Great. you. Bye. See you in a few minutes. <laughs>